So, if you're uh, here for switches and routers and stickers, oh my, you're in the right place. If you're looking for something else, you're in the wrong room. Um, come on. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been officially leading the tech team for four years now. Uh, unofficially, I've been leading the tech team since about scale 15x. So, this is my seventh scale leading the tech team. I first got involved as scale as a speaker in scale 8x uh, and have been at every scale since. My usual day job is network architect, although I'm currently between gigs. So if you need a senior network architect, uh, see me after the presentation or interrupt me. Um. A <laughs> uh, little bit about the uh, networking team that makes this work. Why is that not? There we go. Okay, I guess this screen is showing me what's up next. Um, about the team, we usually have about 20 volunteers or more uh, involved in putting the network together each year. This is a picture of the team at scale 19x. Um, the two guys in the middle and the front are not on the tech team. Uh, the one on the right is Elon. He kind of runs the show and so he, uh, he jumped into the picture because uh, he felt like it. The one on the right was our keynote speaker that year, my good friend Vince Cerf. Uh, some of you may know that name, also known as the father of the internet. Um, most of the people in the picture have been active for three or more years and most of them are still active in the team. Uh, it really is a great team and they do a fantastic and difficult job. So if you see them walking around in the blue shirts, uh, we're, we're blue this year, not orange, uh, please thank them and uh, let them know you appreciate the network. Um, what we're going to cover in this talk, we're going to cover the overall structure of the network, we're going to cover the automation tools we use to keep ourselves sane uh, in running the network and uh, get some consistency. Um, if you want more information about how we manage the Wi-Fi, Rob Hernandez did a great talk, I think it was last year, uh, that covered that. Uh, what do stickers have to do with this? Well. When you have a lot of volunteers building your network, you have a need for them to understand which port things should get plugged into. So we print stickers that show what each port is supposed to be that we can put on top of each switch. And yes, those stickers are one-to-one -one physical alignment with the ports. And they're color-coded by port type and then uh, for the single VLAN ports, they've got the VLAN name actually in text on the port as well. So um, we'll cover some Q&A afterwards. At the end, if people want uh, and there's time, we can do a brief walking tour of some parts of the network for up to 15 people. Uh, we'll see how that goes. That may or may not happen. Um, a brief history of the scale network. Whoops. Um, from the beginning through the second year at Pasadena Convention Center, the scale network consisted of an assortment of HP Procurve switches, Netgear wireless access points, and was arranged as a single flat network structure segmented into some VLANs, but every VLAN was present on every switch with no failure isolation whatsoever. There was no layer three other than our, you know, NAT to the internet. Uh, the third year at PCC, we migrated to Juniper EX4248P switches. Uh, we added three Juniper SRX300 routers and we put layer three separation between the buildings with a three-tiered hierarchy. We've got an internet border router, we've got two routers, one for each building. Hello. That's not me. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then we've got all the switches below that. Um, this year we're still using many of the Netgear WAPs, but we're also starting to roll out newer Wi-Fi 6 capable wireless access points. Uh, we're still using OpenWRT to run all the wired access points. Um, apologize for the eye chart here, but it's not much smaller than the uh, um, terminal window is going to be. Uh, the three Juniper routers are one core border router, uh, an edge router for each of the two buildings. Then we have uh, 25 Juniper 
EX4200, that should be 52 Juniper, um, 48P and 48PX switches, uh, one per meeting or presentation room. So if you look down here, there's one right here. Um, I've got an exemplar on the desk for later uh, as well. Um, we have a grid of switches deployed in the exhibit hall, one per cluster of booths. Um, there's one for the registration area. There's one in each of the uh, IDFs throughout the uh, buildings. There's three IDFs on this floor. There's one IDF downstairs, or MDF actually, where the internet connection comes in. Uh, there's an IDF in the other building, um, actually at the level between the two levels that people know about um, at the end of the stairwell. And then there's uh, a final IDF upstairs above the expo floor in the catwalk. Uh, IDF is an internet, intermediate distribution frame. MDF is a main distribution frame. And um, they're basically wiring closets. Um, we've got two physical servers and a bunch of VMs on them uh, for DHCP, DNS, et cetera. Um, the, there's one deployed in the MDF in this building, one deployed in the IDF in the conference building. We have about 120, give or take, wired access points. They're distributed all over the place. Uh, we have multi-mode fiber between the MDF and three of the MDFs, three, sorry, three of the IDFs. Uh, there's fiber to the conference IDF, there's fiber to the IDF in ballroom C, and there's fiber to the IDF in ballroom F. The catwalk IDF and the IDF behind uh, the registration desk are connected by copper to the MDF. Um, and finally, we run about three miles of Ethernet cable by the time we wire all the rooms, all the cameras, all the um, wired access points, everything else. This is a uh, rough diagram of the network. It's very oversimplified, but it shows you the, uh, the principal routers. Uh, orange is where the fiber connections are. Um, and uh, green is uh, copper giggy. So, uh, some meaningless statistics about the automation as of December 2023. We had 695, I wish it would make up its mind. Um, 695 lines of configuration input data in the tab delimited files. 39,213 lines of switch configuration output. So as you can see, we have a great deal of economy by um, using abstract confi configuration files that are easy to read to produce the Juniper config files that are much longer. Um, it takes about 10,000 lines of Perl code to do that. Uh, there's about 3,000 lines of Perl and Bash code and 51 lines of readme.md also in the repository uh, sorry, 10,000 lines of PostScript to produce the stickers, 3,000 lines of Perl to actually make it all work. Uh, the code and input files are publicly visible in a GitHub repo. Uh, that's SoCal Linux Expo slash scale dash network. Why automation? Well, two primary reasons. Come on. Um, first, 695 lines versus 39,000. It's a lot easier to work on the, 6, 000, the, the 695 lines. And oh, by the way, as a bonus, we get those 10,000 lines of PostScript also. So we're really producing almost 50,000 lines of configuration out of less than 700 lines of, of input. Um, second, we have a lot more team members that understand how to edit tab delimited files than understand Junos, let alone PostScript. How many people have hand coded PostScript? Okay, more than I would have expected, but you can see it's not most of the room. Ideas and trade-offs. The code is written in Perl. When it started, Perl was still somewhat popular, and I find Python annoying. Spaces aren't code. Um, the original code actually started during scale 15x under fire. What I mean by that is things were going wrong on the network, and we figured out that we needed to have faster ways to do massive configuration changes. And so we started writing scripts to do that um, during the show while things were going wrong. It was fun. 
It's continued to evolve and improve since then, um, but that has resulted in, uh, what's the polite term, organic code. <laughs> Uh, some improvements this year, we did uh, better trunk color coding on the stickers. Um, we managed to build a unified configuration loading utility uh, for the switches that will handle both serial and Ethernet based um, config loading. And it will handle Ethernet based config loading both over the management interface of the switch back to back to your, your laptop as well as via um, the uh, serial port or over the network SSH to the whole show. So um, unfortunately, since I'm on a Mac, I can't demo the, uh, the file. I don't have all the Perl dependencies. But the, um, if, I, if I were on the proper system, I could actually SS run one p command and distribute the new configs to every switch in the show with one command. Um, We've added better PoE handling uh, this year. So we, we have the ability to, to PoE power things. Almost all of the uh, cameras are now PoE powered. And um, most of the Raspberry Pis that you see around, in fact, I think all of them this year, uh, for all of the signage and all of the registration desk is all powered by PoE. Um, and we've got a few other things as well. And we've improved our documentation so that I actually know what I'm doing sometimes. Um, mass loading switches. Because how much fun is it to load configs onto 52 switches all at once? Well, we've actually got it down to pretty much a science. Um, this is, I think, last year in the knock when we were uh, flashing the switches before the show. So we were plugging uh, a dozen switches or so in and then going one at a time with a serial and an ethernet cable and loading the config and then moving to the next one and then the next one and the next one. Um, and, uh, oh, this is 19X, so two years ago. So, um, so let's walk through some of the configs and the resulting output. So this is, um, I'm already CD'd into the repo. Um, and in fact, switch configuration is one level down in the repo. So this is what our switch types file. And what this file does is it defines every switch in our network. Um, each switch is identified by a unique number. We give it a name. We give it a management VLAN. 503 is the management VLAN for the conference center. 103 is the management VLAN for this building. Um, we give it an IPv6 address. You may be wondering, where's the IPv4 address? That's because there isn't one. None of the switches have management addresses on V4. Why would we need it? Everything in the show is either dual stack or V6 only. Ideally, eventually, more and more stuff will not have V4. Um, we're hoping not to have to put V4 on anything that doesn't have it currently. So far, we've gotten away with that pretty well. The one exception was the first year we tried V6 only on signs and registration. Registration, we had to back that off because the payment processor couldn't speak V6, and the show management decided that money was more important than my V6 religion. <laughs> and I really can't fault them too much for that decision. Um, but I did give PayPal a really bad time about it. Um, the next column after the V6 address is a type. Um, we'll cover types in a minute, but basically you can see CF room is a, a switch in one of the conference rooms um, where talks are held in the conference center. EXIDF is an IDF switch in this building. Uh, EX room is a room switch like this one below me in this building. Um, mass flash is a special case. That is a switch that is set up so that we can plug 47 APs into it and one uh, device that is uh, set up to, to feed them the uh, OpenWRT image and we can flash 47 APs all at the same time. 
which makes relatively quick work of flashing 150 APs. So four cycles and we're done. <laughs> um, the party switch doesn't really exist anymore. Um, catwalk is the IDF switch up on the catwalk. It has a unique configuration um, to support V4 for the vendor VLANs. And then booth is the type of switch that you'll find out in the vendor booths down on the uh, exhibit hall. So any questions on that before I move on? Oh, the CTF switches, um, they, didn't deci they decided they didn't want those this year, that they wanted to do it all on Wi-Fi. So, um, yeah, probably. This hierarchy um, is, is an interesting thing. That actually allows us to know kind of which switches are, are dependent on other switches. And we have a tool called Switch Pinger that is just another simple little Perl script, but it um, constantly loops and displays which switches are up versus down. And it's smart enough to skip the switches that depend on a switch that's reported down. So rather than wasting a bunch of time pinging each and every d switch that's behind a down switch, it says, okay, this one's down, that takes a couple of seconds to figure out. And then it says, skip, 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 past all the others. So um, that's what this hierarchy column allows us to do. We have a noise level column. This allows us to, we, we hand evaluated which switches were loud and quiet and kind of in between. We um, use this as a reference so that we can kind of prioritize the rooms that are most noise sensitive, getting the quietest switches. Um, and then the type of switch is in the next column. That's just documentation. And of course the management MAC address. Um, we use that because when we log into the switch over SSH um, via the management port, we want to be able to identify which switch we're on so that we know which config to blast onto it. And our config loader is actually smart enough to do that. Yes, sir. It is. We're using a Hurricane Electric Tunnel because the convention center isn't that smart yet. <laughs> yes, the convention center can't spell quad A, so we use a Hurricane Electric Tunnel to make the show dual stack. We have a 48 that Hurricane Electric generally provides over the tunnel. If you want a 48 for your house, you can get a Hurricane Electric Tunnel and do that. So it works very, very well. And uh, yes, that's why it looks familiar. It is indeed one of the addresses I got for Hurricane Electric when I worked there. Um, so, remember that type column? If you look in this directory, you'll notice that there's a file for each and every type. So, um, so this is what a, uh, a typical, um, well, a non-typical actually, IDF switch looks like. This is the um, IDF switch on the catwalk. You'll notice almost all of the ports on an IDF switch are going to be trunk ports. And um, the, thing, the next uh, column is just the interface name and then the list of VLANs on that trunk. Spaces are not significant. Um, the config parser, the, one of the first things it does after it reads a line of config is blow away all the spaces. Um, the backslash at the end uh, indicates that the next line continues this line and spaces and tabs are stripped from the, uh, the following line. Well, tabs are stripped from the beginning of the following line. Not all tabs are stripped because these are tab delimited files. So if you, um, if the, spaces are not, don't count as a delimiter, but tabs do. Um, so, so we strip leading spaces or leading tabs out of continuation lines for that reason. Um, you'll notice this has a vendor backbone VLAN. That is the special magic VLAN um, 499 that has an IPv4 config on it. It speaks OSPF to all of the, the switches on the exhibit hall floor and forwards the, the 
uh, DHCP requests off to the, to the DHCP server uh, via IPv4. This and the Expo Hall switches are the only switches that have IPv4 configurations on them. Um, the uplink on this switch goes directly to the Expo router. Um, all of the IDF switches connect directly to the router in their um, building. Yes. We've got, we, well, better yet, we've got two uh, DHCP servers running Kia with HA pair. Okay. So their act, the, the one in this building is, is primary active for this building. The one in that building is primary active for that building. Okay. And they back each other up and maintain the state tables across. This is all, this, this is all hand edited. Yes, this is the input file. This is part of the 695 lines of input, yes. So this is a typical room switch, much simpler than an IDF switch. Um, it'll have uh, a couple of trump ports for the um, uplink and downlink. Um, downlink is unused in most of the room switches but it's the most common type of port on an IDF switch because downlink can be used to feed a dependent switch. There's a couple of places, at least in years past, where we had one room that didn't have any ports that we could use um, to get back to the IDF, so we literally ended up stringing a cable to the room next door and plugging into that room switch for, for uplink. Um, the other ports you'll notice Instead of a dash, they've got the letters P-O-E, and they're marked A-P instead of uh, uplink or downlink. And you'll notice they have fewer VLANs on them. Uh, they have EX infra so that we can actually get to the management address on the A-P. And then they have scale slow and scale fast, which are the two Wi-Fi networks that the wired access points support. Um, the P-O-E indicator, instead of a dash, tells it that we want to feed P-O-E to that device and then the AP marks it as an AP type port, and that's how the color code on the stickers is managed. Um, and then these VLAN ports are untagged ports on that particular VLAN, and the number to the right is the number of ports to reserve in that category. And you'll notice that as a comment at the end, I keep track of the port numbers that result. Um, but the, again, that's all hand-coded. RSRVD, is just ports that have no config on them, um, and they just sit there not having any VLAN or anything, um, and they get marked on the stickers accordingly as well. So, rather than go through every one of those files, actually I wanna be there. Yes, sir. So, so the question is, has there been thought to using something like NetBlocks and, or, or some other IPAM? Um, and the reality is DNS and IP address management have not been our big challenge. Um, configuration management has been the much bigger challenge. Um, right, I know I can model all the, but then I still have to extract it and turn it into a switch config. So. It doesn't really buy us anything, and um, it has been deemed not worth the effort. So this is what it takes to turn all of that into a, uh, a set of configuration files for the switches and generate the PostScript and PDF versions of the stickers. I type M-A-K-E, and I hit Enter, and it does that. Um, Whoa, that's, uh, oh, yeah, it's, it just went by really fast, but it, it did all of this. <laughs> so I'm not going to scroll it all back up, but suffice it to say it goes for a while. 
Um, but that just generated 52 switch configs um, and uh, four, or two PostScript files and two resulting PDFs from the PostScript files. Um, and the two PostScript files are the result of another Perl script that combines 52 PostScript files into those. No, make is, is the make command you're used to. So this is, this is the make file. Well, if you want to type the v6 address, you can. I usually use the DNS name. I'm using expect.pm for putting things onto the switch. No, I can hand SCP it if I want. Well, I wanted something that would use generic SSH right. and that I could control. <laughs> yeah, there is. She's got it. So, so the question was, um, why am I using expect instead of one of the various other automation languages? And the answer is because I chose expect, basically. Um, and the projector is... There's a what? No, it's SSH. It's just SSH. Um, but expect works with SSH and serial also. So that was convenient because I can just hand it a file handle. Um, most of the other automation, yeah, most of the other automation won't work over a serial port. Um, so I end up with this output directory that has a, a comp file for each of the switches. Um, So for example, this is the config file for this room. Um, remember that the, uh, the, the specification file for EX room fit on one screen and left a lot of room be below it? Um, this is uh, line one of 553 lines of configuration in this file. So we get to the bottom of the screen, we're, uh, we're at line 45. And we haven't even gotten out of the, uh, the, the SSH public keys that we load yet. So and then we set up SSH, we set up syslog, we set up the, uh, the um, chassis configuration um, to get rid of unnecessary alarms and to uh, manage the fiber port in case it has one to be the correct type. Um, we set up our SNMP. Um, and then we have our interfaces configured, and you can see this, the, that, that one VLAN line in the config file expands to that whole description and unit zero family Ethernet switching port mode trunk, VLAN members, and then the list of VLANs, and then all those closed braces. That all came from one line of, of input. So it's, uh, it's fairly efficient. And then these uh, inactive ports or the RSRV ports, the reserved ports. So that's pretty much it. I mean, it, it goes on for a while, but you get the general idea. Um, oh, I should go past interfaces because there is more. Um, PoE configuration, um, the default route configuration. Notice the only default route on the machine, V6. There's, there's no L3 V4 on this device. Anything V4 that passes through this device is doing it strictly L2. Um, rapid spanning tree, LLDP. 
We make a lot of use of LLDP here. All of the APs report LLDP, all the switches report LLDP, all the routers report LLDP, all the PIs report LLDP. So it gives us a lot of visibility into the network for troubleshooting. Um, all of our VLANs are present on every switch. The config automates that nicely. Um, I should actually show you the input that drives that. So there's this VLANs file, and you'll notice that it's very short, um, and it has just a bunch of include files. That way we're able to maintain the VLAN list for each building separately. Also, the year we went back to the Hilton, we ended up uh, having to accommodate that. So um, rather than destroy all of our existing config, because we knew we were coming back here the following year, we simply created a special set of config files for the Hilton. We discovered a few special cases that required some recoding, but we did it. We managed to do all of that in such a way that the following year when we came back here, it wasn't too terribly inconvenient or disastrous. Um. So this is the VLAN definition file for this building. Um, each VLAN gets a name, a VLAN ID, an IPv6 prefix, an IPv4 prefix, and that's pretty much it. Um, 200 through 499 are dynamically generated by the uh, configuration generator. Um, I should show you how that's done, because that's special. This VVRNG specifies the vendor VLAN range the vendor VLAN name prefix. So all of the vendor VLANs are named vendor underscore VLAN underscore and then a number, which is the same as the vendor VLAN ID. Um, we give it the entire slash 48 spec, but it knows to use the ones that correspond to 200 through 498. Um, it's smart about that. We give it a slash 15 of IPv4 um, addresses to, uh, to pull from. And then we designate a vendor backbone VLAN, which is the VLAN that all of the vendor VLANs route into that is then carried over layer two to the router from the catwalk switch. So this is a booth definition file. So this defines each of the switch. This one booth file defines all of the switches in the expo hall. They're all identical. Um, so the two trunks, obviously, uplink and downlink. Um, six ports of nothing just to push that out away from um, things so that people don't get confused and plug things into the wrong port. If they're off by one, it doesn't work instead of working weirdly because um, working weirdly is harder to troubleshoot. Um, there's the AP ports for the APs that are uh, distributed around the room. Uh, another gap, port gap for safety. And then this VVLAN 16. So what that says is take the next 16 ports, put each of them on an individual vendor VLAN, and um, set up all the OSPF and everything for that to work. So, as an example, whoops, dot com. So as an example, this is a booth switch output config. As you can see, lots of stuff. Standard, you know, the usual trunks, the port gap, AP ports, more trunks. The other port gap. And then we get into the vendor ports. So each one is an individual untagged port, port mode access, 
members, vendor, VLAN, VLAN number. Okay. So that's, a, that, that's the whole port config, but then we go down further. Um, oops. We get into this VLAN interface, and you'll notice there's a unit number for each vendor VLAN. So 232, it's got a 9 at 4 address. It's got a 9 at 6 address. It's got a, they, they all use the same firewall filter. Um, and that firewall filter basically says, this port can talk to our DHCP server for DHCP, our DNS server for DNS. It can do neighbor advertisements, neighbor solicitations, ARP, that sort of stuff. It can ping stuff, and it can get to the internet. It can't get to other vendor VLANs. It can't get to the scale network. So we did that because we had, believe it or not, vendors one year that were doing interesting things to other vendors and to the network. So, so we decided to put them in silos instead. <laughs> and our life got much easier thereafter. <laughs> Especially since we can automatically generate all these silos now. Right? Remember, all of this config for all of these VLANs came from that one VVLAN, you know, 16 command line in the, in the input file. Um, and then DHCP relay v6 and v4 for the vendor VLANs. Um, the server group allows us to ha define different uh, DHCP servers for different things if we want to. You'll notice that things in the uh, expo hall use 103 colon colon 5. Things in the uh, other building use 503 colon colon 5. And things on the AV VLAN, AV runs their own DHCP server for reasons passing understanding, but it's what they wanted, so we made it work. Um, they don't speak V6 yet, but we give them V6 anyway and hope that someday they'll get smarter. Um, but we also, and Hilton is just left over. It's harmless to have it there, so we didn't bother to take it out. Um, this is the V4 version of the same thing, and you know, AV has its own DHCP server on V4 also. Um, but you'll notice that the, the vendors are all in group vendors. Um, and then, of course, we've got the static default route for v4 and v6. We've got the PoE specs. Um, we've got our protocols. So um, in this case, the switches are actually doing router advertisements for the vendor VLANs themselves. Um, You'll notice that we don't set the M bit. We do have a DHCP server. People can get an address from it if they want for DHCP v6. But primarily, we prefer Slack. It's just cleaner and easier and faster. Um, but we do provide other stateful configuration. So we set the O bit and not the M bit in our router advertisements. Um, we do provide RDNSS in the, the router advertisement as well as providing DNS servers as DHCP options. Um, and then we provide an on-link autonomous prefix. And again, all of that, all, part of what gets generated from that VVLAN statement. It's a, it's a great economy. All of these OSPF statements, part of what gets generated from that VVLAN statement. All of these OSPF3 statements, which is OSPF for IPv6, generated by that same statement. The firewall filter is statically built into the code, um, though some of the, uh, no, that's actually all static too. Um, so, yeah. But it gets duplicated on every switch automatically. And then, of course, the standard VLAN list, um, storm control, pretty straightforward. L3 interface specifications for all the vendor VLANs. And then that's it. Oh, and then the vendor backbone. So a lot of economy, especially on those switches. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Let's log into. 
that switch. So currently this one's only got two LLDP neighbors. Um, one is the, uh, the trunk port for its uplink and you can see that that goes to uh, expo-catwalk which is the name of the switch in the catwalk and then the other one is expo to a-3 which we know is from naming convention that is a wired access point that switch isn't very interesting let's do I think that's the name nope Reg desk. 42? Okay, so I've got 18 ish. Including questions, yeah, I know. I'm almost done. So this is the Reg desk switch. It should be a little more interesting. Huh, our Pies are not doing LLDP anymore. I'll have to get that fixed. So two, two wired APs and, and embarrassment on the Pies. Sorry about that. But lots of lots of unconnected ports, lots of connected ports, stuff. Um, happy to answer any questions about that or drill into things people want. Let me go back and make sure I'm out of slides. Can I still introduce which? I can't introduce a loop. Um, for one thing, there's layer three. Th there are no loops at, at layer two. Like physically, there aren't. Um, we are running rapid spanning tree on all the switches anyway as a safety measure. So that in case somebody does plug in stupid, it, it won't crash the entire network. Um, the, the, the first year when, when we started developing this stuff, um, it turns out we had a, uh, a switch sitting in the um, game night area and uh, somebody decided they were going to be helpful. They found a, a cable that wasn't plugged into anything at one end and they plugged it into that switch. It turns out the other end of it was in that switch. And we remember I said we were running a flat layer two across both buildings? Guess what happened? Boom. Because we also weren't running any spanning tree back then. Because it turns out the HP switches, by default, don't do spanning tree. <laughs> Yay, HP. Um, although these are now HP switches as of a couple of weeks ago, I hear. So, Because <laughs> HP bought Juniper. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, HP is a, HPE is part of HP. Um, so I'm not going to walk through the code. Um, it's kind of embarrassing. It's visible in the repo if you really want to go see it, but enter at your own risk. Um, abandon hope, all ye who enter, et cetera, et cetera. It's also not super interesting, to be honest. It's just a lot of lines of Perl that have been hacked together to do what they do. Um, it is actually organized into a couple of Perl modules as well as scripts that, that make use of those modules. So there is some effort at compartmentalizing an organization. Um, stickers are more fun, sort of. So if you really want to look under the hub, go to the GitHub repo. So this is the printer I use to print the stickers. It is a, a Suma DC4. I don't use media that wide. I use a 24 inch media roll because it costs a lot less. Um, that's an example of a switch with a sticker just applied to it. I've got examples up here as well. Um, that's generated at the same. You saw me generate them. This is this is what this is um, screenshots of the PDFs that are generated, um, just to kind of show off some of the different color coding of the different ports, fiber ports, or that kind of cyan. Um, this is actually before I update, I captured these before I updated the color codes for the trunks. So on this one, the trunks are that kind of magenta and they don't have any differentiation between an AP trunk, an uplink trunk or a downlink trunk. 
those are now differentiated on the actual stickers. They're blue and green and yellow and fun stuff. Um, but you can see the, the reserved ones are gray and then the vendor ones are green and then the, uh, the purple ones are individual VLANs, uh, untagged. And the, if you look closely, you can see that they have the name of the VLAN on them. Um, the stickers come out with a one-to-one -one physical correspondence between the boxes on the sticker and the ports on the uh, switch, so they're literally very easily referenced. Um, the seemingly illegible text identifies more detailed port of information. Um, they're printed vertical, 10 labels wide on 24-inch media, uh, or a Cal 631 adhesive if you care. Um, and with that, we're down to questions. And she's about to kick us all out. I noticed the network went down yesterday briefly. Did, was that uh, only wireless that went down, or is that something that you Well, had? I don't think the whole network went down yeah, yesterday. I, noticed, I was in here, I noticed. Yeah. OK. Uh, I think somebody had actually managed to cause this switch to reboot is, is what happened. Uh, most likely, somebody tripped over or kicked a power cord or something. Um, that's the usual cause of that. By the time we got people dispatched to look at it, it was coming back up. Um, we've had a couple of occasions where they were reworking one room and they pulled power cords apart and put them back together, um, thinking that that didn't matter. So, you know, we can only do so much and when the electricity goes away, the switch stops working. Any other questions? In most cases, yes. Router, IDF switch, switch. So usually only too deep. A few cases there's three deep, um, and very, very few cases there might be a fourth. I'm not colorblind, but can you tell us colorblind-friendly No. There is, there is no effort to make the stickers colorblind-friendly. Okay. Yes, it, it was, it it was enough. The question was, are the, are the stickers colorblind-friendly? And the answer was no, there's been no effort in that realm. So far, nobody on the team has reported the need for it. And really, the stickers only need to make sense to the team. So if somebody tells me that they're colorblind, I'll ask them what makes a sticker colorblind friendly and try and figure it out. They're just PostScript set RGB color instructions. So it's actually fairly easy for me to change for the following year. Next question. How about your SRXs? Are they just? Those are, th those are artisanal. The, they're, there was not enough SRX to be worth automating. So those, those configs are hand generated. And in fact, I've done significant editing to them at this show and I need to capture that back into the repo. Next, anybody else? Uh, what are you using for DHCP and DNS out of curiosity? Say again? For DHCP and DNS, what were you using? Did you roll your own DHCP servers or? Oh, we're, uh, we're using Bind and Kia. So we let, we let Internet so Software Consortium build our software for us. Uh, over here. Um, you had SNMP enabled on all the switches. Do you guys do any fun graphing in Libre NMS or anything like that for all the bandwidth? I'll let Ryan answer that. <laughs> so to answer that really quick, uh, we are working on uh, Prometheus, uh, which does some SNMP, and then we're going to be dumping all that into Grafana. So the short answer is we're not using a traditional uh, Zabbix, Libre NMS, Observium, that kind of stuff, but it isn't in the works. But we have a Perl script that tells us which sources are up and down. Do you care about cable color or you just do whatever's in the No, we don't care about cable color. That, that ship sailed long ago. <laughs> I had sort of a sociological observation. Look around this room. Anyone who is losing his job or needs a job, think about it. These, this is your network to do your network, right? I just want to point that out. Yes, if you have a job available for a network person, please see me. <laughs> Any other questions? All righty, well, thank you very much for attending. I hope it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs>